Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Hello, I'm David Temple, and I'm excited to announce my guest on The Thriller Zone is none other than New York Times bestselling author Ted Bell. Ted's larger-than-life hero and swashbuckling counter-spy Alex Hawk has taken readers on action-packed and treacherous page-turning missions across international borders. There's so much to talk about, so many things to share, so let's not waste a single minute. Please join me as I sit down with Ted Bell on The Thriller Zone. By the way, you'll notice, Ted, that um, I have been stalking. Well, you won't notice that I've been stalking your Instagram, but because I knew you're such a debonair, yeah. suave guy, yeah, right. I, I upped my game. Uh, you've got it working. I mean, you look like you just stepped off a yacht. <laughs> I've got to tell you something, Ted. My yacht is much bigger than yours. Oh, sure it is. Uh, Mine's 350 feet. I don't know what yours is. Mine is a dinghy. So <laughs> I did... Uh, <laughs> I don't have a boat. This is the first time in my life I've not had a boat. It's making me nuts. Why do you not have a boat? Well, I had, I had, a, I had a lot of different boats when I lived in Chicago. I had a, a, a beautiful Hinkley Southwester 35, oh. a 1954 uh, Block Island champion that I bought in Manchester by the sea and trucked out to Chicago Yacht Club. And I sailed that for 10 years out there. And then when I moved to Palm Beach, we, I had a dock right on the water that went right out to the intercoastal. Oh. And so sailing didn't make a whole lot of sense on the intercoastal, but having a powerboat did. And so I got a one of those Carolina boats that had the big flared hulls. Sure. And, and the big one, and then the, the, very sleek. And I had um, three 250 horsepower outboards on the transom. It was just like insane. <laughs> So my, my stepson and I would just fire down to Ocean Reef Club or to Miami and Key West. And it was wow. great. It was great, yeah. And you're in Connecticut now, right? In Greenwich, right. Got yeah. it. Back and do you, no boats, though? No boats. I'm, I'm thinking about joining this club called Belhaven Club. And if I do do that, I might get a power boat that I can go over to uh, Long Island with from, from the Belhaven Club or stuff like that. I don't know. Who knows? Wow. But now in my life is sort of changing because my beloved girlfriend, Victoria, bought a beautiful house in Charleston. And I'm going there on Saturday and I probably will stay hopefully like a month or something. Charleston, um, South Carolina. Yeah. Charleston, oh. South Carolina. Yeah. That's down my neck of the woods. Where are you? Is that, are you from South Carolina? No, I'm from North Carolina. I'm from a Charlotte area. Oh, Charlotte's a great town. Yeah. Way, I way back it. when. Yeah. Love North Carolina. It is beautiful. And Charleston, I mean, between the, the history and the, the oh. old buildings and the water, it's... And the it's garden, the garden, yes. the architecture. I mean, our street, which is Lawrence Street, um, you just, just driving down the street or walking the dog, you're looking at the, the most beautiful gardens you can imagine and incredible oh. architecture. And everybody's very house proud. So oh, the yeah. house is like perfect. Oh, yeah. Um, ours was built in 1769. 
So wow. it's still a British um, colony then. Um, so it's a very British architecture, but um, it's, it's, she found a beautiful house in, in a great historic neighborhood. I always thought it was interesting, though. What do they call them? The, the porches run. Um, Lo, they call them loges. Loges, yeah, they go yeah, uh, the front back instead loges, of the front. The loges run on every floor yeah. from the street side all the way to the back of the garden. Yeah. And so it's all this walking and sitting room and, and stuff like that. But it's fair, they're very pretty and really high ceilings and beautiful yeah. windows and beautiful fireplaces. And so I'm, I'm going Saturday. I can't wait to get there. Good for you. Yeah, I've been hanging out in this house all by myself for like months. I'm just having a, when I finished my book, I was like bored to tears. So the good news is you're going down there. The bad news is you're going at probably what? The single hottest part of the yeah. whole year. Sticky, 90, muggy. 99 yesterday. Dude, it's the she worst. Can't even, she couldn't even go out and walk the dog. Yeah, there's nothing I can do about it. We have great air conditioning now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The walls are so thick that sure. the, the, the living room is, is like, when you walk in, you feel like it's air conditioned, but it's not. It's just the cold air stays inside. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do. I grew, I grew up in Florida, so I've been through Yeah, you, Yeah, you know all that stuff. But I just, you know, just want to be there. Yeah. So, Ted, so, let me ask you, because I've, I've seen a couple of different numbers. I saw 12, I saw 13. Is it 14 New York Times bestsellers now? Yeah, because um, that, I think there are, I'm not sure how many ha Hawk books there are, but in addition to the Hawk books are the first two books I wrote. Right. One of them was Nick of Time, which was um, done by St. Martin's. And then the sequel was called The Time Pirate. And and The Time Pirate is, is up for serious con consideration as a streaming Netflix uh, series because it's got time travel, it's got Nazis and pirates and Sure. It's great, it's great. So I've got a great producer out there who's putting all this together for me. And that was, was that 2000? That was your first book, right? The, uh, Nick of Time was the first Nick book. Nick of Time, yeah. And I was still, I was writing that when I was running Y&R and living in London. And so every spare minute that I wasn't working, I was writing that book. Wow. Making vacations and everything. Um, and I continued to write it when we came back and moved to Greenwich on the commute, on the train going in and out, uh, I was writing it. And uh, I never had any idea that I'd be able to sell the manuscript, but, but St. Martin's just loved it. So, and it got number four on the times list for the children's hardcover, which was the first book. I mean, that was great. So then, then, so you're out of the gate in 2000 with a, in the YA book. And then shortly thereafter, that, well, this was well before, um, I think I think Hawk, which which is the first Hawk book, came and I want to say two thousand three. Three, yeah. So three years later. Yeah, and then came Hawk. How did you jump from YA? You must have something tells me you were hardwired for that James Bond esque thriller oh, type before you always, wrote. Always, yeah, always. Yeah. And I was much more of a fan of Ian than of Bond. Um, yes, I Bond was sort of boring. I mean, the movies made him made him funny, but the books were just very dry because Ian said that he wanted him to be the gray man that doesn't stand out in the crowd. And he, he, made, he wrote it that way. And yet, I mean, he's I mean, he's obviously a fabulous writer. And, and uh, but, yeah, I, I, I thought we, I could do make him a more interesting character than, than Bond and sort of take Bond as a lead jumping off point. And then have this guy be the sixth richest man in England, Bachelor of the Year in Tatler Magazine in London every year. Yeah. Whatever. And uh, so, yeah, so I just had, I had fun thinking up Hawk, you know. First of all, how does it feel to have James the Legend Patterson call you, your Alex Hawk, basically the new James Bond, which. It was good. Oh, <laughs> so, thank yeah. you, Jim. <laughs> he was, he was. It was funny because he and I were, were not very friendly when we both lived in New York because he was running uh, the creative department at J. Walter Thompson. Yeah. I was running Y&R Worldwide Creative Department. And so he was always trying to steal my guys and I was trying to steal his guys. <laughs> so it was a competitive thing. And I remember I was standing on Madison 72nd outside of Ralph Lauren and waiting for the light to change. And this bus goes by and I see this huge ad all the way down the side of the bus saying kiss the girls 
the new movie, the new book by James Patterson. I went, that son of a bitch. And now he's written a novel. He's <laughs> like, <laughs> so then I moved to Palm Beach. And uh, which he lives there as well, right? Yeah, he does. And he yeah. was like three houses away from me. Wow. And so we we became pals, but he's a feisty. So have you ever met him or talked to him? No, but I've I took his master class on masterclass.com and, and got a real good sense of what he was about after 15 yeah. or 20 episodes of that. Yeah, yeah. But he's a he's a feisty guy, you say? Yeah, he is. He's like sort of uh prickly. Yeah. Like, like he would say, he would call me and say, So what are you doing? I said, I'm working on the book. He said, Well, come over here. I, I gotta talk to you. And so I go over there and it's in the afternoon, and he's sitting out by his pool, and I sit by the pool with him, and I say, What's on your mind? JP. And he said, what, why do you go down all these roads in your, in your work? I said, what do you mean? He said, you just go down these roads. You go down this road and take another road and you take a detour, you go back to an old road and then back. What do you, what is that all about? I said, I like to not know where I'm going. I like to, I want it to be like, oh gosh, I didn't think this was going to happen. And he said, well, I don't know. I, it's not my way. I said, no. He said, you don't outline, obviously. I said, I've never outlined and I never will. He outlines everything. He outlines every single beat and he, yeah, and he and, does and, it by hand on pencil on legal pad and he does it until he is happy with it. So you, you and, never outline? But that never have. But then he turns it over to his, you know, his his army of writers. Right. You see, he gives them like 60 pages of plot and then they turn it into 250 pages or whatever. Um, oh, is that how that works? Yeah. Yeah. So if you go in his office, they're like just stacks of manuscripts all around the room. He's just got like 30 books going. You know, the guy's crazy, but anyway, he was very helpful to me, I have to say. Well, I was going to say, how interesting is it, the the uh, parallel advertising exec, advertising exec, right. Right. a Florida, Florida book, book. And right. now, granted, nothing against, nothing taken away from you, but he's... The word prolific doesn't even quite begin to do it because of the volume that he's written. Right. But uh, I'm not sneezing at you. You got your first one in 03, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, 2 and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 20. I mean, you're not sitting around goofing off uh, on some no, leisurely no. boat ride of yours. You're you're um, cranking. Because I'm, 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 I'm never happier than when I'm just in that living in that world with all those characters. It's and just, Pete... They're like my friends. I mean, you yeah. Know, and like I sit down and they all start talking and again. I go, I love that. I love that he said that because I don't know what they're going to say. I totally get that. It's like I'm taking dictation. They're sure. just talking. I'm not thinking, well, he says, Hawk says, you know, we've got to find this woman. And then Congreve says, well, she's dead or whatever. I don't, I, that doesn't even occur to me to think what they're going to say to each other. They just say it. And it just comes out of the blue. It's like I'm overhearing the conversation and writing it down. Taking that is, that's a gift, Ted. You know that. I guess because, you know, people sort of like the, they like the books. Well, I was going to say, I'm loving Czar and I'm looking that's at- That's my favorite, by the way. Yeah. Well, I guess that because you sent it to me. 700 pages yeah. uh, is, that's no, you know, that's no slouch. And I'll tell you what, the, the, well, I've got so many things to say about, but basically the thing I love the most is the volume of detail. You don't just, you don't get in the car, speed away, go shoot someone, go. I mean, it is, you paint the environment, you layer the characters. It's, it's, it's a beautiful tapestry of words. Well, one of the things I got from Jim uh, that I, I mean, he didn't give me a lot, but he did, he did occasionally say something I would go okay that's good that's a good thing to know and he said you know, he said he said when you're when you're really in deep into the book you should not think of chapters you should think of scenes in a movie and each chapter is a, another scene in the movie and it's just like you're watching the movie and then it, you have it dissolve over to okay, now we're over here and now he's in, on the Riviera or whatever and it said just think of it as a scene instead of a chapter because the chapter you kind of think well it's what's beginning middle and end it doesn't have to be it can just be just go with it but that was a good thing i got from him uh i i would 100 percent agree and it at about 70 chapters that's fits perfectly with the screenplay i mean when yeah. you break it yeah. down similarly 
So I had this question is we're, since we're on Czar and, and I'm loving Alex Hawk, um, your lead care, how- Is that the first one you've read? Yes, it is. Yeah, here's oh, the beautiful- well, a good one to start with. Well, here, here's the beautiful thing, and I and I mean this in all the best ways, is I had never heard of you. I'm trying to re recall no. how, how I found out about you, but no. I knew the minute I picked this up, I'm like, I've got a new favorite author that I'm going to spend a lot of time with. And I'm not just saying oh, that to you. blow smoke up your skirt. I'm just saying right. this is because I was such an Ian Fleming, James Bond yeah. kind of character yeah. fan. Yeah. 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 And you do you do take it a, a step further and, and I'm loving it. But here's my question. I noticed when I was doing some research on Twitter, your yeah. Twitter alias is Ale Alex Hawk, not you. Right. And right. I wanted to say how similar, classic question, how similar are you and Alex? Pretty, pretty similar. Yeah. I mean, he, I'm not a British Lord. He is. I'd like to be a British Lord. Yeah. I mean, if I could like fall asleep and wake up a British Lord, I'd be happy. But I'm, he's, I think one of the things I, I thought was a failing of Ian's and I'm a huge fan. I've read every biography of Ian. I've been to his house in, in Mayfair uh, where he lived with Anne. I've been to, uh, the, the Golden Eye, Jamaica Golden Eye, yeah. um, and I'm a huge fan of his, so I'm not knocking him. But I just thought that I thought Bond was sort of boring. You know, he just he didn't he never showed any emotion. He was never funny. Um, he was just a guy, and so I was. I just said I'm going to make Hawk charming and dashing and debonair and and a, a, a real ladies' man, and you know, have, most. Bachelor of the Year, six richest men in England, yachts, houses everywhere. So I just said, I'm going for it. And um, you know, I had I had him have a in 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 uh, Seahawk. He has a new yacht built in in Holland, which is 250 feet long. And it's basically a battleship disguised disguised as a gentleman's yacht. Right. It's, it's got radar guided missiles. It's got it's got all this crap and. Uh, He's even on a bow. He's friends with, in, in, in Seahawk, he's friends with Elon Musk. And so Elon tells him about this laser cannon that he's building. <laughs> and, and he says, can I get one of those? And he says, sure. He says, what, what are you going to do with this? It's mounted on the bow of my boat. I can, I can slice things in half with a laser cannon. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, I just made it outrageous. Sure, sure, sure. Well, it's about toys, right? Men in their yeah, toys. a lot about toys, toys yeah. Yeah. I mean, his car is exactly what the car that Ian drove for most of his life, which was a 1953 Bentley Continental R uh, with a souped up engine, nice. uh, steel, uh, steel battleship gray. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's Hawk's daily driver is exactly that car. But then he's got a Ferrari and he's got all this other stuff. Is that black Bentley I saw on Instagram yours? Uh -huh. Oh, that's a beauty. It's I call it I call it the Batmobile. It's like yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's wicked and sexy at the same time. It's good. It is V twelve. Oh, so when I'm it, the torque, when I'm trying to get out on the merit, yeah, you know, going to New York or going north, it just explodes. I mean, for a big heavy car that's just total luxury, it rockets. Yeah, and it's really great. The, the feeling of the torque is just like it's fantastic. It's I had, I used to, I had, I had two Ferraris yeah. in my life and I had a 550 Marinello, which was a V12, sort of a gentleman's touring car. Mm -hmm. And then I had the 612 Scaglietti, which was a, I think the only Ferrari that had a small back seat, um, which I, I never liked that one very much, but I did like the 550. And, but this Bentley, I just, I would never give it up. It's just heaven. So you are basically sharing alex hawk's life you are living the alex hawk life i'm wondering do your friends accuse you of blending the two lives seamlessly no 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 i mean nobody has done that yeah maybe you want to blend me i don't know <laughs> you know i created him out of out of you know one of the great things about being chairman of young rubicam is i was all over the world all the time Oh yeah, and and I made sure I went to like Hotel de Cap. <laughs> I made sure I went to Claridge's and Dorchester and wherever, 
Um, and I just was having a ball. And I was not real popular because I really didn't, I never cared about politics in business. I just, all I cared about was I wanted to do, or for our company, Young and Rubicam, we were the largest agency in the world at that point. And I wanted us to just do the best ads that were being done in the world. That's all I wanted. I didn't care about, you know, what my title was. Or, um, and so one of my jobs being based in London was to go to the European offices and take the creative director and the, and the office uh, guy who ran the office out to dinner that night. And then the next morning, go to the office and have, show them, show me all the work that the commercials that they had done so far that year. And so... Some of the creative directors I thought were brilliant, like the guy in London, Mike. Um, oh, what was Mike's last name? I can't remember, but he was he was fabulous. And uh, but like the guy in Milan uh, was a sort of a pretty boy with a ponytail, and he was on all the magazine covers. And he was a terrible creative director. Oh wow! Yeah, you know, so I mean, I'd go down there, and I was like, oh okay, what have we got here? And um, he said, Ted, you have to see. We've done the best Marlboro commercial for Christmas ever done. I said, well, I'll show it to you tomorrow morning. And I said, great, great. Can't wait to see it. So I go over there to their screening room and he puts this commercial on and it's a guy in a buckboard with two horses dragging a huge Christmas tree behind the buckboard through the snow, like in Montana. Or something. Right. The only Marlboro about it at that point is the da 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 the Marlboro Man music. But there's like, what? And it goes on forever. I think it's like 90 seconds. And I keep thinking, where is this guy going? Right. Why are we dragging a Christmas tree? And what's this got to do with Marlboro? And, and so finally he goes over a hill and he sees a little cabin with lights in the window and smoke coming up. And you cut inside and there's this little family gathered around their Christmas tree with the fire going. And there's a knock at the door. And the, they go to the door and open the front door. And there's a guy standing there with a big fur hood on. And he pulls his hood back and says, Merry Christmas. And it's Paul Newman. And, I, and so, I, so I said to Giovanni, I said, he said, what do you think? I said, I just have a question for you. Maybe I'm crazy. What's Paul Newman doing delivering Christmas trees in Santa? He's a famous actor that lives in L.A., but now he's delivering Christmas trees, you know, with a buckboard. What, like, what's the deal there? He said, it's Paul Newman. I said, I know it's Paul Newman, but I don't understand why he's in the commercial. Because he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't do any Paul Newman stuff. He just says Merry Christmas. And then, and how much did we pay him? Million dollars. Million dollars. Because <laughs> Marlboro had infinite supply. Yeah. <laughs> he said to me that night at dinner, he had a few drinks and he said, Ted, he said, do you know what we all call you behind your back? I said, no, how would I know? It's behind my back. He said, we call you the corporate seagull. I said, the corporate seagull, that's interesting. Why do you call me that? He said, because you fly in, you shit all over everything, and then you fly away. <laughs> I said, that's pretty accurate job description. <laughs> that's about what I do, you're right. Wow. Anyway. Oh, right. nice to have friends in high places. Yeah, right. So, have we started or are we just still? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So, DDB, New York, Leo yeah. Burnett, yeah. Chicago, Young and Rubicam, London. Yeah. Had you always dreamt of being, before writing, had you always dreamt of being in advertising? I'm just curious. I've always been fascinated with advertising. No, I'm, I was, I, I didn't know anything about it, but I, I moved to um, my grandmother. For, for a college graduation present, gave me a year abroad in, in Europe. And I, I got a little house in Switzerland and I started working on what would become Nick of Time. And um, I had a girlfriend from New York who was a Ford model who had was living with this Swedish Vogue photographer in Milan. And she would invite me down to his parties every, every Saturday night. And so I just met all these advertising people from Milan. And they would all say, you know, can I take you to lunch tomorrow? I said, sure, You're right, let's go. And this one guy, Luigi Montagini, said, Ted, you need to be an advertiser. I said, I don't even know what it is. I mean, I sort of know what it is. I saw Cary Grant be an advertiser in the movie, but um, I said, why is that? He said, because you're funny. And funny is really good in advertising. So I said, okay. So he hired me at his agency, didn't speak a word of Italian at that point. 
And it was a German company. And the German owner came down to do a tour of the Italian office. And he stopped by my office, such as it was, and said, who are you? And I told him, he said, what do you do here? I said, I'm a copywriter. He said, oh, do you speak Italian? I said, no. But Luigi's <laughs> going to send me to, Luigi's going to get me Italian lessons. And so he went to Luigi and fired, he fired me. <laughs> Because I didn't speak Italian. He couldn't understand why Luigi would think I could even do the job because I didn't speak Italian. But that was okay. I got the bug just by working there for a month or so. I just love the energy. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and that makes me wonder, what's, what's it like? Let's see, that was, uh, you had to be 25. Something this was like the that, 70s. Yeah. You're 25. What was that like, living in New yeah. York? That kind it was of, great. It was yeah. great. Single in New York in the 70s. It was fabulous. Woo! And I loved the job. I loved it. And I, my first agency was Tinker Dodge in Delano. And Mary Wells was the creative director. And then she left and started Wells Rich Green. But um, I just loved the business so much that I would literally run between meetings. I would run. Like if I, you know, I had a meeting that I had to be in my office for another, I'd run to my office. And so I found out that, that, that Mary, who I later got to know pretty well, she said that they called me the let's who, who do you want to have work on this on this pitch for roses lime juice or whatever the hell it was right yeah boy the boy that runs get him <laughs> <laughs> the boy that runs <laughs> and um i told victoria my girlfriend just started a new job in charleston and i told her the story of the boy who runs i said you want to be like the boy that runs because everybody wants the guy who runs yeah we're so excited they can't wait to get to the next challenge or whatever what do you do you have a, a a really key lesson that you walked away from such a prolific career in advertising that 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 affected your life and has now uh, helped benefit your writing career yeah i do because what i i hated most advertising and still I, now i really hate it because there's, there's nothing there's no good advertising anymore it's just garbage yeah I mean, the only company that's doing anything funny is uh, the insurance Geico. Yeah. They're funny. And that's it. But everything used to be funny or at least great storytelling. You know, the ads we did for Polaroid and McDonald's and, and uh, you know, all these wonderful clients we had um, were, were like, like movies. They right. were stories. They were stories. Um, and so I just, that's the only kind of commercial I was interested in was the story. Um, and, you know, I didn't do like hold the product up, whatever, you know, I just did stories. And I, I, so I just, the power of storytelling really hit home with me. If you could do it in 60 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever, yeah. and tell a, a, a good story with the beginning, middle and end. Storytelling was something I was really interested in. Remember back in the day when the Super Bowl ads were the best thing ever? They everybody yeah. put all their chips on Red Twenty Six on that day, and it, absolutely, they, you would almost watch the you would watch the That's Super Bowl commercial. Yeah, people would, and then the next Monday after yeah. Super Bowl Sunday, they'd run a big article in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal saying the, the new Miller Light commercials are hysterical. Or yep. whatever. and we, you know, we. We did a lot of major, major Super Bowl commercials. Yeah, and shot them all with the same director, Joe Pitka, and, and they were they were stunning. And I was it was just so much fun. You couldn't wait to Super Bowl to see your commercial, like sure, five million people or whatever. What a great living! But what happened, Ted? What happened to those great ads? The last several years, you just Research. Were, huh? Research is what happened. Oh, Research. good. All of a sudden, after. And this was at Doyle Dane, which was the premier creative agency of the 60s and, and 70s. Also, we had a research department. And, and I was like one of the heads of the creative department. And they say, have, and I would take a, an ad to the account guys who were going to go to the client the next day. And, and they would say, well, has research seen this idea? And I said, no. I said, well, you got to show it to research. I said, why? What do they know? And they said, well, they're research. I said, yeah, but what do they know? They don't know anything about the client. <laughs> they don't know anything about how to create advertising that works. And uh, they said, well, the client, now that we've got a research department, wants everything to go through research. And I said to myself and everybody who would listen, I said, this is the beginning of the end. Yep. 
I'm not going to want to do this business anymore yep. with research. And it was just stupid, the comments they would make. Um, so that, and that, that kind of, they took over the research people and the clients liked it because they would feel like they couldn't make a mistake with their boss because the research people had told them at the ad agency that this is what they should do. It wasn't their idea. It was the research people. So they just kind of, ass covering is really what it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it reminds me of uh, early uh, the, the latter days of radio. The reason I got out of radio when is the consolidation, when all the big corporations started buying up everybody and we had mm -hmm. no competition anymore mm -hmm. and it all got watered down, which meant you didn't really follow the ratings anymore. So the guys wouldn't compete and then the, na the stations wouldn't compete. And you're like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Yeah, yeah. right. That's how I felt. But, but it was a great, Doyle Dane was a great place to start. Yeah. They were, I learned a lot in those five or six years that I worked there um, that stood me in good stead when I went to Burnett, um, which everybody thought was a lost cause because they were just doing these critters. You know, they had the Keeper Elves and they had Charlie the Tuna, the, the Maytag Repair. It was opposite of the kind of advertising that I had any inclination of doing. Right. So I, I just brought the Doyle Dane work ethic and creative strategy to Leo Burnett. And we turned the company around inside of a year. Wow. I hired all the old guys who just been resting on their laurels, making a lot of money, and hired all young kids right out of art school or from University of Texas Advertising uh, uh, School. And I filled the place up with all these young Turks that didn't know the rules and just wanted to do the kind of stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to be funny, I wanted to be whatever. And we, we turned that agency around. Um, I'm having a flashback of Mad Men. Yeah. Remember in the old, uh, it, like early in the series, it was, it was one way and then when they, started bending rules and bringing in new blood and just right. going free for all because right. uh, a, a true creative an artist can't really be bound by rules that's no. don't put or them in a box yeah or yeah yeah and then my feeling was and, and they actually sent some people to to my office um when they were getting into production but it was a lot based on y and r it was kind of a mix of y and r and doyle dane Mm -hmm. um, and the head creative guy was sort of um, exactly the, they just nailed it with that guy, whatever it was, John Hamm. Mm. Um, oh yeah, I mean he was perfect. Um, but it was it was fun to watch. And I mean, a lot crazier stuff happened than the stuff on the show. Oh, I, I don't know. doubt that at all. I promise you. I don't doubt that, especially with you. From what little I know about you, I, I would that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. <laughs> It was great. It was great. So, so let's great. let's bring it up to a little bit newer uh, or, yeah. or later in life and say, when when was that point when somebody said to you, they picked up that manuscript and said, wow, you've got the goods. Let's let's do this thing. Let's write up a contract and get going. Yeah. Um, well, the first one that got published was Nick of Time, which was right. the first book I wrote. Um, in which the character of Alex Hop appears in that book okay. as a five-year-old boy with his little sister as a character that's been kidnapped by pirates. And so when I came time to write a grown-up book, I said, I'm calling him Alex Hop because I like that name. There you and, go. But he started in the nick of time. Um, but I just, it's, it's, nick of time gave me permission to take chances because I figured I'm writing for young adults. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be more forgiving than maybe the critical adult audience. Right. So I just, it gave me permission to just let it rip. And I loved every minute of writing that book. Every minute of it was just, and I, I, I didn't have to wait for anybody to tell me it was good. I knew because I spent my whole life reading. That's all I, that's, I spent my, most of my life just reading sure. which is first grade. Um, I was always never without a book in my hand, no matter where I went. Well, yeah. I was going to say one thing about reading your work, it's abundantly clear is that you, you can tell that you're an avid reader. You can tell that you're uh, well-versed in history and politics and research, but I mean, first and f 
at the end, you can flat out write. I mean, let's just say that. But um, is it Stephen King says, if you're not a writer, if you're not a reader? Yeah, that's true. I agree with him. And there's a quote. I just am reading this book called The Plot, which is it's great. It's about a writing creative writing teacher who steals a plot from one of his students because it's so brilliant. <laughs> and he has to deal with the consequences. And the, the, the little foreword of the first pages of the book says, uh, good writers borrow from other writers, great writers steal. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's true. I mean, if I see a sentence or two that are just beautiful, yeah, I can fit them in. I just stick them in. Oh, and do I'm you really? I'm really looking about it because I mean, if I'm, I, if I'm one of the first impressionist artists and all of a sudden every artist in Paris wants to paint like me, they're going to steal my technique. Right. And so that's just kind of what artists do. They take from who went before. Right. Um, but I mean, I would never have a whole page or even a paragraph, but a, a, a sentence here or there or a description of a sunset or something like that. I'll just, you know, lay it in. Back to James Patterson, do you guys still, do you steal from one another and or do you talk on any kind of regular basis? I'm curious. No, I, I still go to Palm Beach now and then yeah. and I'll go out to dinner and I'll see he and Sue and his kid, Jack, is, I love yeah. and uh, really a smart kid. And um, so, I, I, yeah, I see him and we're friendly. Nice. We don't talk on the phone or anything. Um, but yeah, we're still friendly. Let's go to um, uh, another piece of your creative spirit that I'm uh, completely enamored with because I've, I've tested my hand at this. But you you shot out of the gate. Was was your first attempt at screenplay writing? Was that about 25? And did you? Is it true that you sold that like out of the gate? Yeah, I sold. Um... And what screenplay was that? Well, I I wrote a, a, a screenplay of Nick of Time. Okay. When Paramount bought it. Oh, geez. So right out of the, right out of the gate. <laughs> and I mean, I've learned my lesson about Hollywood because I mean, now I've got a great producer out there and I'm, things are starting to happen for me because my, my, my head producer, Mary Alice Haney is, she has two producer partners, two women. One of the girls is married to the CEO of Universal Nice. And another girl is married to the head of Netflix films. <laughs> and so she, she says, we are, we are fast tracking you, you know, with my two girls, we're going right to the top of universal and right to the top of Netflix. Wow. So that's where uh, time pirates is getting ready to go to, uh, to Netflix. I should send you the lookbook. I'd love to see that. It's beautiful. The art is, I, I did most of the creative work on it myself and it's, it's just for producers can, it's like seeing storyboards of what the sure. film will look like. And it's a great way to sell, you know, especially a visionary tale that's got time travel and oh yeah. New boats and I, I I uh I sense a series. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. You wouldn't good. mind at yeah. all. Well, I mean, I everybody says when's when's this when's the sequel to Time Hire coming out? Yeah. And you know, my obligation now is to to Random House to give them Seahawk, and then what's the next book going to be? So sure. you can't take a year off and write another YA book. Um, so, and let's let's do that right right now. So Dragon Fire's out there now. Seahawks coming December seventh, right? Which is a great the, update because it's the the beginning of Christmas shopping. Yeah, so it's a good time for it. Yeah, sure. Well, dude, I'm, I'm already, may I call you dude, sir, dude, hey, master, dude, dude, dude is good. <laughs> Mr. Dude to you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Dude, may I? <laughs> I love that word. And I love the way girls call each other dude now. Yeah, you I do that? love that. Yeah. yeah. Like the millennial girls. Hey, yeah. dude. My wife will do that every once in a while. I'll say yeah. something kind of silly. She'll go, dude, really? Yeah, yeah dude, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great uh, word. What was I going to say, dude? Um, oh, yeah. Talk to me about Seahawk. Let's give me a little inside s scoop on Seahawk. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, so in Dragonhawk, uh, there's the all of the communist and socialist governments uh, under the guidance of the Cubans, Communist Party of Cuba, uh, have formed an unholy alliance. 
So it's China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. If it's a bad actor, they're in the Red Star Alliance. And that's what it's called. Um, and, and Hawk has a mission to go up the Amazon where because they, what they're doing is they're building all these incredibly uh, like luxurious Chinese resorts and they're called dragon fire clubs. And so, um, so they're having a, a meeting of the, all the Red Star Alliance allies from the highest levels in Russia, China, Iran, everywhere. Um, and so Hawk is given information that they're holding this like four day conference way, way up the Amazon. Um, and so, so Sir David Trulove, the head, who's the head of MI6, says, go up there and take that place out. Just wipe it off the map and don't care how many lives are lost. And so that's what he does. And um, so in Seahawk, um, he's decided that he's not spending enough time with his son, okay, Lexi, who is like 11. And so he says, the, the book starts at, at Black's Club, which is, is you know, I don't, I, it's based on White's Club in, in London. And he says that he wants to take some time off to spend with his son. And he's having a new yacht built in Amsterdam. And he's gonna do a circumnavigation with his kid and teach him how to sail and navigate by the stars and, and about women and automobile, everything, everything. It's like a tutorial. Awesome. Sure. So that's like, so that's the idea. It's a big sea voyage, epic sea voyage. Um, so he goes to Havana and he gets involved with, a, uh, he discovers that there's, a, no one in the world knew this, but there's actually a third Castro brother, which is just what we need now is another Castro brother. And so this guy is building a revolutionary communist army um, in the Sierra Madre where Fidel was. And this Castro is going to have a coup against the, uh, the right wing, you know, American friendly government of Cuba. Right. And take them out. So Hawk's job is to stop that plan. Um, and then he goes to Miami and he has some adventures there and he goes to Bermuda and, and it's just, it's just cool. It's all, all mostly at sea with, so, the, laser cannon, with the laser cannon on the bow. <laughs> with the laser cannon. On the bow, yeah. As developed by Elon Musk. Oh, that's my, uh, Take a look at the help section in your Alexa. That's, that's that Alexa thing. What yeah. is it? There's a little speaker over there. Anyway, um, tell her to shut up, would you? No, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can you tell me who said this? I read, a, I ran across this quote: Alex Hawk, a James Bond-like character who kicks twice as much ass and has more money than 007 could ever dream of. I don't know who said that, but I feel like I've heard that. Yeah, I read. I don't know where. I Maybe it was in a review or something. Yeah, I can't find it. It's on one of your books somewhere, and I'm like, man, can you get any better of a quote than that? Good one. Kicks twice. Well, Ted Bell is the new one, James, uh, the new Ian Fleming, and Alex Hawk is the new James Bond. That's a pretty good one from Jim. That's a good quote. Yes. You know that was yeah. really kind of him. Yeah. When James says this guy can write, he can really, really write. Yeah, he did say that. Yeah, how many times does someone use a, a, a word twice in a sentence? You that that was that. really good, actually. That was a great quote, great blurb. I'm trying to imagine as you're growing up and you're an avid reader, I, I want to know two things because this is so much like Alex. Who was one of your most influential authors? Who did you grow up as a either kid or younger years, even today that you go, this author has some kind of magic that I've um, never I can, seen. Before. I can tell you, I can say it right off the top of my head because it, there's only one guy for me. Who is it? It's Scott Fitzgerald. He's the guy I most wanted to be like. Got it. I just like, I think he writes like an angel. Yeah. Um, the most beautiful sentences. And he's just a fantastic writer. And I sort of tried to like Hemingway, but then I read The Old Man and I See It. And I said, this is the most boring book I've ever, nothing happens. This guy goes out by himself on a boat and he's looking for a fish, but he, I don't, nothing ever happens. It's horrible. I'm so glad you said that. I picked up that book uh, last summer and I was like really waiting for something and I read it and I'm like, and I we turned it away. It was going to be great. I mean, the title is like, oh, this is going to be really good. Yeah. Is no. this it? This book's really bad. Nothing happened. But anyway, back oh, to bad. Scott. Um, what was a book that, do you remember a book that I, I bet you it's in your library? Oh, yeah. Well, Tether is the Night. Okay. And the Great Gatsby, which I think is 
I mean, I have two books that I think are the best American novels. Uh, one is Huck Finn, oh. is, I think the greatest American novel. And, and Hemingway himself said that all great American literature flows from Huckleberry Finn. That's what, that's what Hemingway said about Mark Twain. Wow. And, uh, and then Scott. And I love all his books, The Beautiful and the Damned, Tender is the Night. Um, yeah, they're just, I love them. So I, when I'm like, feel like I'm not writing very well, I, I just pick up a Fitzgerald book and read a few pages and I'm back in. You well, know. I got a little inside secret for you, Ted. You're you're doing just fine. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. We're all we're all back here eating your dust, wishing we could be kind of in your sphere up front. So well, that's there you very go. Thank yeah. You. It's true. Now, uh, along that same line, you had to have had a hero, a childhood hero, a young man hero, a current hero. Who who's somebody that you thought, man? I think, I think my first hero was my dad. He oh, was a awesome. B-25 pilot in the Army Air Corps up in the Aleutian Islands, distinguished flying cross for his attacks on Japanese naval convoys. He was a hot shit. Wow. And then incredibly good looking. Uh, he was on the cover of Life magazine with the Cotton Queen. They used to have this thing called the Cotton Queen down south. And he was just a great, he was funny. You know, he was a great chess player. Uh, Oh, his the Civil War historian. Wow. But I mean, just the fact that he, you know, when I was sitting at the KA house, the Kappa Alpha house in Virginia, drinking beer, waiting for my girlfriend to arrive from Sarah Lawrence or whatever, he's flying a plane with eight guys' lives in his hands, getting shot at all day. Uh, and I, you know, because I, mean, I was like 22, maybe in my junior year or senior year. And he was flying a bomber um, in harm's way and, and responsible for the lives of all those young guys. And I just thought that was, it was just amazing. So he, he was, you know, I used to wear his bomber jacket. I still have it. That's awesome. How long did he live? He, he, li he lived a long time for a guy who drank a, a bottle of bourbon every day. I mean, he was just, he was a good, he was from South Carolina. Oh yeah. And, uh, he was a great South Carolinian. And, uh, he used to, uh, his doctor was always telling him to stop smoking and stop drinking. And he told me that, you know, he was like, not, he had turned 90 and he went to see the doctor. And the doctor said, well, Ted, how's the, how's the drinking going? He said, it's fabulous, fabulous. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, Sally, Sally doesn't put dinner on the table till seven o'clock. So between six o'clock and seven o'clock, I drink as much as I possibly can. <laughs> That's what he said. And I have Hawk saying that in one of the books. Say that to his doctor at Bermuda, that Edward the Seventh Hospital, who says exactly that thing to him. How's it drinking? How's it drinking, Alex? Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm holding up my end of the bargain. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, I love that. I love that. So, with, in, so that's your full on childhood hero. Did you have one uh, that came along later or somebody that you looked up well, to? Yeah, I like Gary Cooper. Oh, yeah. You know. Hi. A quiet man. And I like Gable. Yeah. And I like Spencer. I love those guys from that yeah. And I became, I had a house in Aspen for some years. I became really good friends with the actor Robert Wagner, RJ. Oh, a good yeah. friend of mine. We played golf all the time. And he was, he grew up uh, as a caddy at the Bel Air Country Club. So he was, he was out playing golf with Clark Gable and Spencer Tracy and Gary Cooper and Cary Grant. And they were all letting him drive their cars or Duesenbergs or whatever. And he just had amazing stories to tell about those guys. How, wow. how cool it was. it was great. It was great. Yeah. What a charmed life. Yeah. He's, he's a great, he's a wonderful guy, actually. Let's transfer over to writing a little bit. When, when do you, when does that moment, that light bulb go on when you go, oh, I have a solid idea. This, this is, this is it. Now with a lot of Alex Hawks, I got to believe that you have that happen uh, repeatedly, but yeah. when does that happen for you? When do you, and, and, and the next part of that, when do you know that that arc now I know that you're, you're a pantser. So we've, we've made that uh, pretty clear already. But where do you know, when do you know, okay, this is going to be the completion of this story? Right. 
Well, I, when I thought of the idea of, of, of Hawk taking his son for a, a circumnavigation of the globe, mm-hmm. I thought that was a great idea because I could have, you know, have his son have to step up to the plate and do some heroic things and mimic his father, or learn from his father or whatever. I just thought, I just liked that idea. Yeah. Um, Plus, I love the fact that you get, as the reader, the, the, a father can read the story and his son can read the story. That's right. That's right. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Um, but I mean, like right now, I'm trying to think of what to do after a Seahawk. And I'm, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm having ideas and I'm having titles come into my head. And, um, but I haven't got it yet. That was my next question. I mean, I know that as writers, we're, you know, we're rele- we're, we're daydreaming about this one. We're writing this one, we'll release it. And as soon, before right. it even releases, we've got to be working on the exactly. next one. So I'm like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What's so I, I I'm, I'm waiting for that lightning to strike. I mean, I, you know, I just don't have it yet. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, you know, it's, it's still a long time till Seahawk comes out. Sure. And they want me to do one a year. So I've got a year from December 7th. Yeah. There's another one out there. You got time. Uh, I'll be, I'll be all right. Yeah, between your gallivanting down to Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, South Carolina. You know, South Carolina. You know, Charleston. Charleston. <laughs> Charleston. You got to roll that thing a little bit now. Yeah, I love, I love it. I love it because I'm, you know, I grew up with a South Carolinian. You, you had that sweet, honey, Southern yeah. Charleston accent. Yeah. Mm, oh, my that. God. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, Tad and I will dissect book covers and find out some of his writing secrets that make him such a huge success. Stay with us. Alex Hawk, British Lord and Gentleman Spy, is looking for the Queen's missing grandson, whose disappearance may be the culmination of a plot almost a century old. Pick up Dragonfire, the latest breathtaking adventure from New York Times bestselling novelist Ted Bell. Available now wherever books are sold. And we're back. See the cover of Seahawk? Yes, I did. Where is it? Do you like it? I love it. I was going to ask you, I have a note here to ask you, who does your covers? Well, now it's it's Penguin Random House. And I, I think it cover is fantastic. I love this cover. It's, I think it's the best hot cover yet. It is. It. I don't know what it is. It's It's very, um, it's um, modern. The gun and the, it just, it looks like this is going to be good. Yeah. I would buy it just for the cover. And I don't say that very often. And I'm not saying it because you're just sitting here. I did like the cover that I did with Emily Bessler at Simon & Schuster for Pirate, which was the, the, the single orange life preserver floating yes. on the sea at night, just, just floating out there empty. And I, I just, that was my idea. And I really love that. What um, I love, I love the uh, use of color palette, and yeah, you it, it 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 forms an enormous question. I would say that is one of my favorites. Czar is pretty clever because it's a it's it's like a double entendre in image. You can't tell if that's a river or a split, a crevice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at the top um, of the world. But uh, Dragon Fire feels like a movie poster. Yeah, well, I like the guy on his motorcycle. Yep, Overkill looks like a James Bond. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Patriot feels, uh, I'm going to say something, I hope it pisses you off a little bit, kind of James Patterson-ish. Overkill? Is Patriot. That the one? Oh, Patriot, yeah, I can't even remember what that is, what it looks That's like. That's a, a guy running through a, uh, he's running past the lens and it's a Oh, spear. with a gun. Yeah. yeah. My favorite so far is C- Seahawk is just, it's just great. It's it dynamite. Like, buy me. Yeah. You know, you're walking through the airport, you stop in the bookstore on your way to the plane, yep. and you walk by that, and you just say, okay, I'm buying that. Hopefully, I won't have to buy it. Hopefully, you'll autograph it and oh, just oh, you're send gonna it to get me. One. Don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah, you will <laughs> get one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question for you. I always love this is This is into the little minutia of it's the radio guy and me coming out. Paper and pen or laptop or desktop? Uh, uh, d- desktop and then okay. an I and then a and then a Mac, you know, whatever it is, the, 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 one, the one I'm on now, yeah, MacBook Pro. Um, MacBook. so never, so not, not fountain point, not fountain pen, not ballpoint, well, not pencil, no, none of that. I'm try, I tried it in the beginning, yeah, you know, on legal pads and just felt like work. <laughs> <laughs> but when you sit here doing this and it's just coming out, yeah, it feels, it feels good. 
You know, this is so funny. I want to, I want to drill down on this because you and I share, uh, I, I've gone to more conferences and I've sat in, uh, classes and I've, I'm, you know, this is my third career. So I'm really trying to do this right. Sure. But I sit on a fence, my right leg dangles over the side that says, come on, dude, it's imagination. Just let it roll. Just let right, me, right, let my right. fingers just go. Do the talking. Yeah. yeah. And then let, and the left leg says, no, we've got to have form and structure so that we know where we're going. And I'm like, no, yeah, no, you don't. Yeah. I think, I mean, I don't want to know. I want it to be a surprise. Yeah. You know, and I think if, if you write it like that, then it's fun for the reader because they don't like, oh, I never saw that coming. Because if you're getting surprised, they're going to get surprised. Right, right, yeah. right. And not just at the end, but all the way through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I, mean, how about, I have this character in Dragonfire that I have this very good friend of mine named Anson Beard, who used to be... Uh, chairman of Morgan Stanley, and he's a good friend of mine down in Florida. And I was at his house one night for dinner, and he took this other guy who'd never been to his house before upstairs to his office where he's got all these stuffed animals and sailfish and all the stuff he's caught. His brother was Peter Beard, who was the famous guy in Africa who was married to the model. Yeah, he just passed away a little while ago. But anyway, so so Anson... uh, and this other guy, who was another guy that I knew, uh, were both. So Anson asked the other guy, are you a member of the South Carolina Plantation Society? And he says, of course I am. I've got a beautiful plantation just outside of Charleston. And Anson said, well, I, my mother and father had a, a plantation. They, we, they were members of, uh, of the South Carolina Plantation Society. And uh, she said, we had a lot of strange people around in those days. He said, did you ever hear of a guy? down there named Shit Smith. And I, I just froze, like the, the headlights. I went, what did he say? <laughs> and I turned around, I said, Anson, what, what did you say this guy's name was again? He said, Shit Smith. I said, his name was Shit Smith? He said, yeah. So I named the villa, the Dragonfire Shit Smith. <laughs> and my, my editor, Tom Colgan, at Putnam said, we can't do that. I said, well, just, we'll just call him Mr. Smith, you know? But, Every now and then, you know, somebody called him shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great name for a bad guy. That's funny. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's good. All right. By the way, I want you to see that I did come prepared. Uh huh. Ah, the, the see through. Yeah. The, the traditional see through is that with an olive? I hope. Yeah, double olives. Boy, does that look good. I might have to go make one of those myself. I just, I, it's been sitting here getting warm, but I thought, you know what? I, I want to be able to bring it out because. It's excellent. It's excellent. Of anyone you, that I know would appreciate it, it'd be you. You know the guys from the crew, Mike House and all those guys? Yes, yes, yes. They, when they do these things, yeah. they're drinking. Oh, yeah. They're drinking. They say, fix a drink, Ted. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm going to. They're, just, they're, they're going. I'm going to start having a session. My uh, wife and I had a podcast a uh, uh, summer or two ago, and we would it would call uh, cocktails and conversations, and we would we would have a cocktail before we're getting ready for the show. Sure. Well, the good news is we had a really lot of fun doing it. The bad oh, news is by the end of it, we were so soused it was <laughs> a little embarrassing. But yeah, we want to bring. I need to bring that back because. Let's let's think about it. You you relax a little bit with a cocktail while you're doing yeah, a yeah. show. It makes it fun. Yeah, drinking yeah. is fun. Yeah, it's good. It's good. And speaking of which, while we're wrapping things up, because I know you got sure. a busy schedule and I don't want to eat up all your time, but no, I'm enjoying it. Thank you. I am too. This is really delightful. All right, you're invited to a super posh party. We won't go into details where it is, but it's wonderful. It's it's at the dreamiest location you can think of. I want to know what car are you going to arrive in that might not be your Bentley? What cocktail will you be having at this fine occasion? And who I one like the one you just showed me. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and who is on your arm? So three things. Dreamiest location. What car is you going to arrive in? What cocktail are you going to be drinking? The martini and uh, who's on your arm? Well, I would probably, I probably would drive the Bentley because that's the car I, I just, that's my go-to. Yeah, it's beauty. Uh, and I definitely would have Victoria de la Masa, yeah. who's a Spanish countess and my girlfriend who yeah. lives in Charleston uh, on my arm and nobody else. 
Perfect. She's fabulous. She's just fabulous. You know, I'm Victoria. going down there Saturday morning. I'm just, I can't, I've been sitting in this house by myself writing that book. And I'm just ready to get, get out of here. Like, yeah. Enough. I bet she is beautiful. And oh, here you go. Gin or vodka martini? I, my father, who loved to drink and drank a lot, but you never saw him in any way out of control or anything. But he's, I think it was my grandfather or my father. When I first mentioned gin, because I probably experimented with it in college, but um, I, my dad called it loudmouth soup. <laughs> it made you think you were like you were a little really smart or really tough guy, or and just rah, rah, rah. right. Loudmouth soup. So once I heard loudmouth soup, I said, "No, I'm not going there." So you but, stuck with vodka? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's funny, uh, in my early days, uh, when I was I was in Chicago, uh, which is one other reason I knew about your uh, advertising days, yeah. I was doing a radio show there, and we were doing Tanqueray martinis. Now, what I have learned through the years that Tanqueray is not, uh, no offense to Tanqueray, but it's not the gin uh, to drink, because then I discovered um, Hendrix, and I thought that that's better. Which was which is the gin that you, that you like? Hendrix. Hendrix, yeah, that's a, a good one. Yeah, it's a botanical blend and it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I think I've got a bottle in there. And yeah. I'm there on, my, on the bar. But I will say this, and, and this is another thing we share. I do believe that a vodka martini is, in my opinion, the true cocktail because, and my wife and I've had this conversation. So with vermouth or no vermouth? I like mine bone dry. I, I like an olive. I know it's going to be an olive. And I had a friend introduce me to one day, a bartender in Chicago at a little bar called, I think it was a oh, gold star sardine bar. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do sort of my oh, yeah. favorite name for a bar ever in my life. And I, I it was on like division street, I think. And I used to go by it all the time. I lived on, uh, on asked, uh, asked, what was, what was my street? Aster, Aster street, Aster, which was, a block up from the, the famous hotel. Um, okay, anyway, but one block off of, of, the, of the river, of the lake. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, it was it just had a big sign hanging out over the door and said, stop and drink. <laughs> <laughs> that was the name of the place. Stop I love and it. Drink. Let's go to, and we used to go there after work. Just nice. it was a crappy little bar. But it was just so funny to go to a bar called Stop and Drink. Well, the little trick I learned from the Gold Star is they kept their um, vermouth in an atomizer and they would literally just go, Brilliant. just, Brilliant. just a mist. And I was like, that's the way that's I want cool. it. Yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, okay. Oh, here you go. As we come to a closer cl conclusion, when you're writing, are you a fan? Do you like to listen to music or do you like it quiet? I keep thinking that I'm going to have music and then I end up not because I think I might find it distracting or something. Yeah. And if I had it, I don't know what, you know, what I want Wagner or what I want, you know, Beethoven, I don't know, something. Um, but I have, I bought a, one of those Bose speakers. Uh -huh. So I thought I could have it in here if I wanted to and try it out. I just haven't tried it yet. Sure. It might help or it might be distracting. Okay, here's then th this will be a variation on that theme. You're taking a long trip, long flight, could be a right. train um, with you. It could be anywhere in the world. You yeah. have one book to read and you've got one CD to listen to. What would be that book and what would be that CD? Well, I should show you the book because I'm recommending it to everybody I know. Can I just duck out in there? Please and do, it? please do. It's, it's br brilliantly written. Yeah. All right, let's take a short break as Ted hunts for his recommended reading. And I wonder if you'd do me a small favor. If you're listening on your favorite podcast channel, would you take a quick moment to like? And if you're watching on my YouTube channel, would you consider liking and subscribing? As you can imagine, it takes a lot of work to create these shows. And if you like and share via your favorite social channels, you'd help offset the big tech algorithms as well as show me that you like the work. I'd be mighty grateful. Okay, now back to the show. Okay, and action. <laughs> Work with me, people, please. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Hello, this is Ted Bell, the author of the Alex Hawk spy novel series, and you are enjoying, as am I, The Thriller Zone with our host, David Temple, who just happens to be a fabulous guy. So 
have fun. So it's called the anatomist. And here's, uh, here's the cover, I don't know if you can see it. And his name is Federico Andujazi. And the book is called The Atomist. Can you see it? Yes, Federico. Andujazi, I think. I love the cover. Isn't the cover great? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, it's just, the guy's an incredible writer. And it's not like the kind of stuff I normally read, but it's, it's really good. How would you describe it in like a sentence? Um, if you say it's something you don't ordinarily read. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of erotic. Okay. You know, the first five pages, I don't know if the whole book is, but I mean, he's an incredibly elegant writer. Um, and I think Victoria would love it because she's very European. Yes. Um, and erotic, I'm sure. So she's, <laughs> she's bingo. <laughs> That's why she's on the yard, pal. <laughs> Bingo. Um, oh, um, yeah. I, I'm just. What have, what have I been reading? I'm. I. I was one of the original Stephen King fans, and everybody made fun of me because they said, "I said, why do you read that horror trash?" And you know, and I would say, "Look, the guy is like," and I because I just read The Stand, which I, and then The Shining, and and I said. You guys have no idea what you're talking about. This guy is going to be the American Dickens. Yep. He, he's the guy is fabulous. Yeah. And um, so I'm reading Rose Matter, which I've never read. Stephen. And then I love this guy because he's one of my Florida writers. Tim Dorsey. Tropic of Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's hysterical. It's hysterical. So I'll oh, probably pick this, I'll read this on the plane to Charleston. That's awesome. I'm trying to think of what is Stephen King's new one called? Billy Summers. Billy Summers. I was reading, uh, I was scanning uh, Twitter today. Linwood Barkley said, a day and a half, fastest I've ever read a 500-page book. Have a crick in my neck to prove it. Well done, Stephen King. <laughs> good for him. That's great. Yeah, he's um, good. He is good. Yeah, the, saying he's good is like saying, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I like breathing, you know. He's really, really right. Water is wet. <laughs> yeah, that guy can that guy can put a word together <laughs> in a sentence or two. Yeah, right. Last question. Yeah. If you could give your younger self one piece of sage advice, if you could go back and say, here, come here, young Ted, could be seven years old, could be fifteen, could be twenty-one. Right. right. What would what would that be? Um be honest and um and never do anything that you don't love. Like that's why I wanted to become a writer because I loved reading. Um and it's kind of the reason I I said if I gotta make some money, which I did after college, I said, why not go into advertising and be a copywriter? Because at least I'll be writing. Right. Yeah. What I didn't realize is it'd be spending other people's money to go to the south of France and shoot a commercial at the Hotel de Cap, you know, and just be living it up, you know. Yeah. It was a pretty good life, yeah. Yeah, you have had quite a life. And we, and we look forward to seeing what is next for Ted Bell. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope what's next is going to be a universal movie um, of one of the Hawk books and a streaming, Netflix streaming series of the Time Pirate. Wow. Um, you, you've, you've seen the Time Pirate uh, cover, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've got yeah. it here. That's pretty good. Yes, I do like those. And it reminds me of, it has a feeling of, well, I'm trying to think of who I fantasized and escaped with. I was always a big Huck Finn fan being me in too. the South. But um, but Hardy Boys, I mean, you know. I love the Hardy Boys. I read every one of them. Loved it, them never got any better than that and no, it was great it was and great. we need I to name the character in a hawk book after the you know it wasn't one writer that it was one name on the book as the writer and i can't remember his name right this minute but it was like like five or six or ten writers that all contributed to the series it wasn't just one guy that was writing him but i i think my inspiration for nick of time was treasure island yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I just said, if I could write a book as good as Treasure Island, um, that, not, I'm not saying it is, but it's 
it was a way to like a a north star you know and it's so it's kind of cliche but the one word that popped that bubbles up to my mind when we talk about this is the element of escape you could just you you just run away to another land right, right. and you get lost in that world that's absolutely it's the beauty of it all i loved um i love going up the amazon with hawk awesome. and, they, and they get they 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 run aground um because it's a deep keeled yacht and so they're stuck in the center of the river and 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 the skipper is afraid they're going to get pushed broadside to the current and get flipped over. It's a 250 right. foot long yacht. And so they're, so they're sitting around thinking, what, how are we going to get out of here? And all of a sudden they hear these noises of like paddles in the water and they turn the lights on up in the rigging and they're surrounded by canoes full of headhunters and cannibals that are firing poison tip arrows. And Hawk runs up to the bow and there's a guy with a, a arrow in the middle of his chest, dead on the bow. And it's a it's a really hairy scene, and I loved it. It was just so much fun to do. Um, but it was great learning about the Amazon. It's just an amazing, amazing uh, force of nature. I guess I'm wondering what part of the world you're going to escape to next. And I guess that will take us post Seahawk, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I always, I've always tried to go to places that I'd like to be. Sure. You know, that's why I picked Bermuda for him because I'm, I'm a huge Bermuda fan and I belong to a beautiful club there. And so I go there every chance I get. Yeah. So I gave him a house on Bermuda. And I was, Victoria and I were having lunch at this. Have you been to Bermuda to Hamilton? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I love it. So the hotel that's on the, on the Harbor is the princess, I think. And I've not been there. The Hamilton princess. And so Victoria and I were walking out of the restaurant through the lobby and there was this, this, this couple and a couple of older people and a couple of kids and they saw me coming out and they stopped and they were looking at me and then they came over and they said, are you Ted Bell? I said, mm, yeah, I am. They said, tell us something. We've been spending the last two days trying to find Tea Kettle Cottage where Alex Hawk lives. Where is it? I said, I can't tell you. <laughs> he doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be disturbed. <laughs> but I love the idea that they they actually thought it was there. That is amazing. That was great. It was great. It was really fun. That's got to make you feel awesome. Oh, like like a million a million. Oh dollars. sure. Yeah. You no. Know, but Ted, it something make you feel better, as they say. Well, so I'm reading uh, Czar for the third time. That cheers me up. Oh yeah. <laughs> Any book you're gonna read three times, you gotta like it pretty much, right? Yeah. Well, I would love for the next time that we uh, speak, uh, if it isn't um, somewhere around December when the release of Seahawk, uh, or I, w I wish that would, we, be, that would be good timing for me. I wish we could sit down face to face, have a cocktail, and do it proper. Style. Let's do it. Let's do we it. Got, we got to figure out how to do between this. Between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. To be decided. And where do you want to do it? Well, we'll just have to figure that out because I'm on. I'm in San Diego, and you're in Connecticut, and we'll just have to. Maybe we have to just, let's see. Oh, you know what? I'm going to be down in uh, Miami uh, first week of November. I love Miami. Yeah. My fam my, my wife's Miami. family's down there. We stay uh, at the, the, the hotel on Brickle, Brickle Key, the uh, mm -hmm. Mandarin. That's got the pool and the, and the white sandy beach. It's right uh, out in the middle of the, you know, it light, lights up the whole skyline at night. And it's yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Great restaurant. Way to slum it. That's a, that's a shame. Just slum, it. Just slum it. Yeah. <laughs> Ted, this has been awesome. Thank you so really much fun. for your time. Really, I knew it was going to be. Yeah. yeah I, I feel, feel the feeling. I mean, I've only, you know, I'm only through, uh, partly through a czar, but I feel like I know you. I feel like I know Alex and I, you know, that may sound kind of whatever, but I don't really care, but. I, I'm going to give you one heads up on czar. Yeah. You're going to cry at the end. Oh, okay. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Okay. Well, turns out to be all right, but it's it's this incredible tragedy that befalls Hawk at the very end. Well, I yeah. am kind of a softy, so that won't be too hard to do. <laughs> yeah, I cry all the time. But Victoria says, "You cry if a fly lands on your computers." I mean, you you just cry all the time. <laughs> she makes me cry. Well, in a good way. 
Yeah, I was going to say it's her it's her heart that makes you cry, probably. Yeah, it's great. She's just great. My, and it's so funny. My wife does that to me. I, I have such a deep passion for her heart and her soul that we, yeah. we'll be talking sometimes and I'll get, she calls it misty. She goes, why are you getting misty? And I'm like, I just think about how much I love you and you're just yeah, so I'm awesome. The same way. I'm the same way as Victoria. It's yeah. just, I can't even tell her how much I do. You We're know? lucky guys. Yeah, totally, totally. So, yeah, thank you again, buddy. My pleasure. I love being with you. Wasn't that a treat? If you'd like to know more about Ted, simply go to tedbell.com. Now, let's shift gears to one of the promising thriller writers in America. Next Friday, you'll have the pleasure of meeting the lovely and talented Megan Collins as we discuss her latest novel, The Family Plot, a book that's been called by Publishers Weekly an entertaining and chilling tale of family secrets, lies, and primordial fears. So join us next Friday. Yes, that's Friday the 13th, when I hope you'll join me on the next episode of The Thriller Zone.